morning, everyone. My name is Michael Atkinson. I'm the Vice President of Wealth Management at GNF Financial Group, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. There are a lot of uh, economic uncertainties we are facing today. We have a, uh, a changing landscape for the Vancouver real estate market. We have questions about uh, what the Fed is going to do, what Bank of Canada is going to do, what's going to happen with interest rates. Of course, we have uh, Needless to say, a changing political landscape in the United States. So to help us walk us uh, through some of these things going on and make sense of it all, I'd like to welcome Brian Yu uh, from Central One. Brian Yu is the senior economist at Central One Credit Union. He is an advisory committee member of the BC Housing Consumer Advocacy Council. He's been uh, the past president of the Association of Professional Economists of BC. Maybe just a word about Central One Credit Union. It's a trade association, liquidity manager, payments provider for 114 credit unions across Ontario and BC who collectively uh, service 3.3 million members and hold over 112 billion in assets. So I'd like to hand it over to Brian Yu. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks for GNF for. Uh, organizing this and for your members for uh, for attending the session. Um, so for the next 35 to 40 minutes, uh, as Michael mentioned, I will be covering a few things on, on the global economy. We'll take a look at some of the uh, uh, the current state as well as uh, what some of the political uncertainty means potentially for the economy. Uh, and, uh, and I will look into the uh, sort of the rapid shifting nature that we've seen in the, uh, in the current uh, uh, housing market for Vancouver. Um, so I thought we'd first take a look at uh, the, the current global performance. A lot of the data that, we're, that we currently have is, is of course, pre, uh, pre-election. It's uh, what was happening up until that point. Um, we will see in the next few uh, quarters what, uh, how markets and how the economy reacts to uh, the changing political landscape. Uh, but if we look at the, the current global performance right now, um, I'm showing on the screen here um, a purchasing manager's index. It's, a, it's an indicator we look at. Uh, to gauge the, the current strengths and also direction of the global economy uh, using services and manufacturing um, as, the, uh, as the indicators. And, and what we're seeing here is that uh, as, this, as these indicators are, below, are above the zero line, uh, we are seeing some growth in the economy. We have continued to grow, although it's been a very, um, uh, a very volatile and a very, uh, sort of a, a lot of movements in the numbers. Uh, we've had a very weak start to the year in 2016, uh, that was a result of, of relatively weak Chinese growth, uh, underperforming uh, U.S. economic activity, uh, and by mid-year we had the Brexit, uh, uh, the uh, again the uh, unexpected Brexit vote, uh, which now has caused some ripple effects through Europe. Uh, and uh, but what we've seen in the more recent months is that there is some uh, some momentum gain there or uh, momentum that we're seeing in the in the broader economy. Uh, the purchasing managers indices are, are showing that there's higher sales, higher output activity in and a lot of the major markets, including uh, Japan and Europe, uh, are, are all showing uh, increased levels of sales and activity in, in both the manufacturing and service sector. Um, that being said, although the numbers are, are showing and moving in the, direct, in the right direction, uh, what we have right now um, oops, sorry, uh, is uh, an economy that continues to be a, uh, in a slow growth phase. Um, the numbers here are, that I'm showing here are from August, but there was a more recent uh, forecast update uh, as of uh, late October, but the numbers are really the same. Uh, the, the IMF is only expecting a global growth uh, of about 3.1% this year and only 3.4% in 2017. And, and what to note here is that we still remain below the five-year average for economic growth, 15-year uh, average uh, pre-recession periods for economic activity as well. Uh, what's happening is that there's still a lot of uncertainty in the market. Um, the, we're, we're seeing this uh, ongoing um, rebalancing in, uh, in the overall economy and when it comes to China in, uh, and as it moves to more consumer-oriented economy. We're seeing uh, the slow impacts of, um, of, oil, of low oil prices, although it helps the, the advanced economies. It's taken a big hit out of uh, those exporter, exporting types of economies. Um, Europe, as much as it is, it is showing some signs of life, it, it's still uh, still quite weak. Uh, and if we look at the um, 
the impact in terms of the, the global economy, what it really reflects in part is, is this low inflationary environment that we're seeing as well. Uh, these are for 2015 numbers, but what you can see here is that inflation in last year uh, was essentially closer to or zero or heading around um, uh, maybe 1% in, 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 uh, in certain advanced economies. But overall, it's been a very low price growth environment. And part of this has to do with the fact that there has been very low oil prices as well, which tends to, uh, um, to uh, 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 put some dampening pressure on uh, inflationary. And if we look into 2016, so far the numbers, uh, are, are there's some, there some a little bit more inflation as the impact of the oil prices have uh, dissipated, but the overall uh, trend is still quite low. And that's really a reason why we're seeing a, a very low central bank policy rate. Um, if we look here, you know, there's a lot of squiggly lines, but essentially uh, a lot of the central banks still remain in a, in a very low uh, policy rate environment. If we have um, certain areas like uh, uh, Japan and Switzerland and the uh, the, um, generally the ECB area, they're all, their policy rates are essentially at zero. And not only are they at zero, there's also other non-conventional policies that are currently in place, quantitative easing in uh, Europe. Uh, you're also seeing some other uh, non-conventional types of uh, policies in Japan uh, explicitly targeting long-term yield curve, something that they really haven't done before. Um, and when we're looking at all the numbers in terms of the overall growth performance, we're looking at the inflation performance and the policy rates, so what it does suggest is that um, the current economic environment is one that there's a very much a demand insufficiency right now. Um, there's not enough um, private sector demand, not enough investment, there's a lot of uncertainty, and governments aren't spending, aren't, aren't really opening up their wallets in order to try to, to fund a lot of infrastructure spending either to boost the economy. Um, so we do a quick scan of just, I've already kind of sort of covered some of this, but if we do a quick scan of some of the, the key uh, markets right now, what we are seeing is that in China, um, if you are kind of exposed to it, uh, you do see that um, they're, they're in a relatively moderate growth pace. It's around in the seven to seven, around 7% 7 range, uh, well below where they've been in the past two decades, where they were in double-digit growth rates. Um, and, and right now, the, the, the move, and we don't expect to see much upward movement in growth. It's more likely we're going to see uh, further uh, downward pressure in longer-term China growth. Uh, China continues to rotate itself more towards a consumer spending type of economy, a little bit less export-oriented and infrastructure-oriented, and that's going to have a, uh, uh, some ongoing pressures on the um, uh, on um, uh, essentially global demand, also commodity prices, uh, and so the commodity cycles. Though we are seeing some uplift, and more recently, and we'll come we'll come to that in a bit. Um, the underlying demand from China is still going to be pretty. Uh, I think pretty modest going forward. Um, China, of course, is, is a, a much larger player than it has been in the past. Also has uh, significant spillover effects into other economies, into Africa and, and Europe as well, as a demand driver for some of these areas. Um, and if we look at uh, Japan and Europe, uh, again, I, I mentioned this already that despite the fact that we do have this very low policy rates and substantial monetary stimulus, uh, Japan and Europe continue to struggle with growth. Uh, the, the Japan, despite its efforts recently to really uh, to try to lower the yen, and hasn't been able to. Uh, it's been um, it, it faces really poor demographics as well as um, just generally poor demand in the market, and that's really uh, hampering it to that uh, a low growth of about one percent. Uh, Europe, uh, they're showing some uh, some growth uh, in the manufacturing side. Uh, but they still face a lot of uncertainty right now, especially going forward when it comes to Brexit. Um, we haven't really seen much negative impact on growth as of yet uh, from Brexit, but I, I think that the uncertainty is there, and uh, uh, the general consensus is that the, the Europe and the UK in particular is going to have a negative follow from uh, the, the longer-term impacts of the, the Brexit vote and what it means for uh, inter-regional inter trade, labor market movements, uh, and the like. Uh, Europe also faces some overhang from the high debt levels, high unemployment uh, from, the, from the recession. Um, so, the, so the numbers here are still going to be pretty, uh, pretty weak for, for a lot of these advanced, uh, advanced markets. Uh, I think that the, the, like the most positive picture that we're still seeing out there is uh, the, US, uh, the U.S. growth picture. Um, in the first half, of course, it wasn't a very great uh, performance. It actually very much underperformed most uh, estimates and expectations. 
Uh, there was a weak housing market, relatively or weaker investment in the housing market. Um, the exports were uh, were curtailed by the impact of the high uh, U.S. dollar. Uh, oil prices uh, in the past, oil prices would have been a a positive for the U.S. Uh, however, given that they are now such a, a large producer in the shale side, it also led to a significant cut in capital spending. Uh, but we have seen a rebound. Um, the third quarter number came in at about 2.9%, uh, largely as a result of um, uh, the inventory uh, buildups, but also uh, strengthening in the um, consumer side of the economy, as well as um, some, uh, a rebound in exports. Um, we do expect to see that the U.S. will continue to uh, grow at a relatively moderate pace of around two and a half, two to two and a half percent. Uh, and what's driving this is really going to be the the consumer. Uh, we've seen a ongoing strength in uh, consumption activity in the uh, in the U.S. and, and it really reflects a, a labor market that continues to build. Uh, build up a lot of jobs. Uh, what we're seeing here, we're not quite where we were in 2015 when we were averaging around 250, 225 to 250,000 jobs per month in the U.S., uh, but we are still trending at about 180,000 job gains uh, per month in the, in the U.S. economy right now. Uh, we're, this is also leading to, um, uh, again, onward pressure, ongoing pressure on unemployment rates, which are about uh, less than 5%. We're seeing wage growth uh, in the U.S., so that's a, that's a good sign that their economy is, uh, is, start, is really turning around and really, uh, uh, and, uh, really riding on the coattails of uh, a consumer-led recovery right now. Um, the inflationary pressures in the U.S. have also picked up, where uh, the uh, sort of the core underlying inflation still is above 2%. Uh, and uh, a rising of uh, uh, overall inflation levels as well. Um, so again, we're looking at the signs, what kind of signs there are for the U.S. economy and, and, and whether or not the U.S. continues to be in a, uh, a positive growth phase. And, you know, the retail sales numbers that we're seeing remain on a positive up, upswing. And there's a lot of expectations that housing will, after what we can still consider a pretty uh, a pretty weak year in 2016 will uh, will reemerge and, and be a stronger growth uh, growth driver going forward. Uh, the the current consensus forecast in the U.S. is about 1.3 million starts up, and that's about 18% increase uh, for um, 2017 relative to 2016. Uh, so if that does happen, we will see a big increase on the residential investment side uh, for the U.S. growth uh, the growth cycle. So. Uh, with the with a, with a labor market and an economy that largely is growing in the U.S. and, and tightening up, um, the next question is always is going to be or, or is uh, what happens to the uh, federal funds rate and when does the U.S. Uh, 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 hike rates again? Uh, they did last December and they've kind of been on hold since. Uh, we are looking at uh, this uh, this December uh, essentially for them December 14th um, for the next rate hike. Uh, it's, it's essentially the markets are, are almost giving 100% probability that, that the, the Feds will be hiking uh, at this meeting. Uh, they very much uh, have uh, given the uh, – their communiques have um, established that that's what they want to do in the sever, barring un unforeseen, for, uh, uh, unforeseen shocks uh, to that point. Uh, after that, uh, there is um, – the market is essentially looking at about two more hikes in 2017 and two more hikes after that in 2018. Uh, so we are on this um, uh, on this uh, rising rate cycle for the, the U.S. in our view. Um, one thing to note, though, is that uh, the, the U.S. is doing relatively well. But overall, if we were to look prior to no, uh, the uh, election, the general uh, trend in bond yields was quite low. Um, that would really suggest, again, it's a reflection of that low policy rate environment and pretty weak external outlook. Uh, for the broader economy, uh, but since then we've we've definitely seen a, a rebound in uh, in uh, bond yields or selling off of bonds, and uh, largely again, and I think this is it, uh, it's because this happened, right? We saw the the Trump effect uh, taking place. It was a uh, it was actually unexpected. Um, there was um, uh, I, I thought it was going to be relatively close. I didn't think that Trump was going to win. Uh, however, he did, and then now we have. Um, uh, very much a sort of divided type of a country in the U.S. right now. But uh, overall, though, if you look at the where the control lies, it's with the GOP, it's with Trump. And if we take a step back and start looking at the policies that um, that uh, were proposed prior to the election, and the reality is I don't think a lot of people were 
uh, giving it as much uh, thought as they probably should have. And as a result, we had a, a lot of market movements during the election night. Uh, but if we look at Trump's economic proposals and kind of step away from all the other issues that are ongoing, uh, what we do see is that the overall tone of the uh, of uh, Trump's proposals are very much um, pro-growth for the U.S. They are looking for obviously targeting 25 million jobs. Whether or not they can get there is another question. Um, but they're also looking at substantial infrastructure spending, uh, tax cuts for households and businesses especially, uh, from 35 to 15 percent, uh, pipeline approvals. So there's going to be a lot less climate-oriented talk. Um, there's going to be reviewing of um, a lot of trade agreements, um, WTO and NAFTA. Uh, they've, already, they've already mentioned they are going to cut, uh, completely pull out of TPP, all those negotiations, uh, and also potentially put tariffs on, on imported goods depending on, on country. Uh, so if we look at the kind of the policy and what it means for the economy and why we saw a big uplift in those uh, bond yields, what it is is that a lot of this is very much um, inflationary uh, in terms of the uh, the, uh, the reviews of all the trade agreements, it will make goods more expensive for, um, for Americans and in general. Uh, import prices are going to be higher uh, and, and broadly as well, and that's going to be inflationary for the market. Infrastructure spending uh, in an economy that is already has about uh, only 5% unemployment rates, uh, a, a you know, substantial spending activity is going to be inflationary as well and also boost economic growth. Uh, and if we look at the, the um, impact of some of the tax proposals, uh, that would also likely lead to uh, increased activity in the U.S. economy um, as, again, companies also bring back some of their potential offshore uh, activity. Um, so these are all stimulative. Uh, trade measures are restrictive and inflationary. Uh, and also, uh, this is also um, good for the U.S. dollar as well. So, so I think that on, on all, that's one of the reasons why we see such, a, uh, such large movements in the market. Uh, the Dow is up about uh, 4% since the, the election. We've seen 10-year uh, U.S. yields go up to about uh, over 2%. So there, again, in the yield side, we're worried a little bit more about inflationary pressures, but also, and again, it's because there's going to be a, a deficit that would be, a large deficit that would be involved in uh, if they were to meet these, uh, uh, meet these proposals. Uh, we, but we have to be a little careful, though, um, because these are right now our proposals. Uh, we don't know how many of them will go forward or, or, uh, and uh, how much spending and how much tax cuts will actually uh, come forth once they are, are, are set in stone. Um, so we do need to uh, be careful that some of the market may be a overreaction right now as a result of what uh, the current proposals are, not what is going to be the case in, let's say, in January. Um, so more broadly, I think uh, in our own forecast, and these are uh, some of the forecasts from the IMF, but even our, our outlook is still that the overall economy still remains pretty soft right now uh, in terms of its underbelly. Um, there's definitely some upside risk, I think, from the U.S., uh, in part for the U.S. economy. That should provide an, uh, an uplift for Canada as well to drag us along through exports. Uh, but there is a risk on that end is really that some of the trade agreements like NAFTA get reopened and Canada, again, uh, falls short in terms of its uh, negotiating power and, the, uh, and some of the negative impacts on our, uh, for example, our, our softwood lumber, which, again, that's another issue that uh, we have to work through. Uh, but other commodities, uh, meats, uh, labeling, uh, there's a lot of uh, negative that can come through on the trade side that could negatively impact uh, Canadian growth. Um, so if we move on from the U.S., uh, I, I think that for Canada, uh, Canada really is, is much more aligned, I think, with the, the broader global economy in terms of our current um, our growth outlook. Um, we had a very poor first half of 2016. A lot of this had to do with uh, the fact there was very low oil prices and cuts in capital expenditures. Uh, then we saw the, the Fort McMurray wildfires. Um, but uh, we are expecting to see a third quarter uh, rebound uh, in the in the numbers. We, uh, you know, we're it's already past third quarter in, in actual to calendar terms. Uh, uh, but we are looking at the uh, um, the data that should show about a three and a half percent growth rebound. Uh, and uh, before settling after that, a lot of the, the uh, rebuilding efforts are, are going to start, and also some um, oil sands production that got cut during the wildfires came back online as well, which would boost the. Uh, the third quarter growth, uh, but uh, but I think that if we go forward here, our, our average outlook for 2017 2018 is only for about a two percent growth rate for Canada as a whole. Um, 
what's going to be driving this, and we think that um, there are a number of factors here that uh, the oil price conditions are still going to be too weak for, uh, for much Canadian growth in terms of capital expenditures. Uh, we also see some risks coming on the uh, housing side as well as um, a, a weaker than expected uh, rebound for exports. Um, so if we kind of trace some of these things out, uh, what we do see here is that um, when we look at for the past year in terms of where our growth was, it was I already, as I already mentioned it, it was largely in the business investment side. We've kind of been reliant upon uh, consumers and residential investment uh, and a little bit of government in order to boost our economic growth. We do see some positives coming from the from the federal side fiscally as a result of of the um, the planned um, uh, stimulus package or or at least an infrastructure package. Uh, a lot of it was already announced in the uh, uh, in the budget, uh, but in the more most recent fiscal update, the government also added more uh, infrastructure spending over the um, over the next uh, decade. But really, that really kicks in probably about 2017-18. Uh, so we will see more um, government spending, and that should help to at least provide some uh, uplift for the for the Canadian growth cycle, uh, or at least provide some uh, stability to it. Uh, but we don't want to we don't want to put too much of an emphasis on how much it matters. Uh, you know, the numbers we we ran is roughly around about a half percent, about 0.4 percent growth in terms of an impact, not including. Uh, some of the multipliers, but um, but overall, it's going to be a a positive for the uh, for the Canadian economy. Uh, a, a lot of it is going to be geared towards um, uh, some transport infrastructure, but also other social types of infrastructure, probably affordable housing as well, to be in there. Um, on the weaker side, however, is exports. Um, one of the interesting things about the Canadian growth or lack thereof is that uh, exports have been much weaker than uh, had been anticipated by the Bank of Canada and by, by most others. With a, with a Canadian dollar sitting around uh, 72 cents or so, we're, we're around the 70, 75 cent mark, uh, what we're looking, we would expect to see is a lot more uh, increase in export activity to the U.S., particularly for non-commodity products. Uh, and, and unfortunately, though, what we've seen is, is a very low uh, uh, a low growth type of environment for exports. And we look at vehicles and parts, they had, um, uh, they were generally uh, trending a little bit lower. They were more recently, they've had a little bit uptick. Um, merchandise exports or other manufacturing exports, those were kind of, uh, those were essentially flat as well. And one of the reasons for this lack of traction is that it's not only about the Canadian dollar anymore. Um, when we had a high Canadian dollar, we ended up losing a lot of capacity in our, um, in our manufacturing side of the economy. Uh, so it takes a long time for that to come back. Uh, we're also lost, um, uh, lost competitiveness or lost uh, business to other markets uh, like uh, Mexico, including and also the uh, southern U.S. state. Uh, so there's been a structural change in the in the Canadian economy in terms of our manufacturing and our export cycle uh, and our export industries, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we've seen this this lack of of growth um, in the uh, the export oriented sectors. Uh, the other issue is going to be oil prices. Um, there's a lot of there's currently a lot of a movement in oil prices, and this year we've actually moved. Uh, we've been trending, uh, or so I shouldn't say trending. We've been fluctuating within a uh, 40 to 50 dollar range. Uh, we're more recently we're around 46 dollars, uh, and there's um, there's currently a discussion going on between OPEC and Russia whether or not they can agree to um, to cut output in order to shore up prices. Uh, right now, it seems that Russia looks to be wanting to freeze their output. Uh, OPEC, of course, wants a full-on cut uh, from its members as well as Russia to bring down um, their uh, their production by about a million barrels per day. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, the market seems to think that they could come to a deal. I'm always spec uh, skeptical when it comes to uh, OPEC um, because, especially in a low-price environment, uh, they do have a incentive to really maximize their revenues because uh, they need to maintain uh, their fiscal spending uh, and also and uh, maintain stability in their in their countries. So. Um, you know, there could be a deal. I, I'm not convinced that there will be. Um, 
And the other component is even if prices do rise, depending on how much they go, it's going to trigger a, um, it, it would essentially trigger some of the shale, uh, shale oil production activity in the U.S. picking up uh, when you hit around that $55, $60 uh, a barrel range. So uh, we don't think there's going to be a lot of upside for oil. We, could, uh, we have it around 45 and moving into that 50, around a $50 range for the next year, you know, we, we can even move it to $55 and that's fine. Uh, and that will help Canada in terms of income, but it's unlikely to provide much of a boost uh, for our, um, our actual production and, uh, and construction of, uh, of new oil sands projects. So we expect to see um, uh, if there is oil, higher oil prices, it's really going to impact some higher income uh, for the country, but not necessarily uh, trigger a new capital expenditure. Um, the other component that I think is going to be a weakness for Canada uh, is really the housing markets. Uh, the housing markets have been uh, actually been quite well, relatively well across the country, pretty flat in certain, in, in most provinces, very strong activity um, uh, up until recently in areas like Vancouver, in Victoria, uh, Toronto. Um, but we do expect to see some downside risks toward the housing market going forward, and this really reflects the, uh, the current environment for um, mortgage insurance policy. Uh, the, the, the federal government essentially, uh, the federal government had uh, um, tightened up their mortgage insurance rules uh, recently. Uh, they are now, you're now required to qualify at a five-year poster rate rather than a, uh, rather than the contract rate. And, and for some buyers that really, has, that is going to have a substantial impact. It cuts their purchasing power. Uh, we've estimated around, you know, 10% down payment. We've looked at about 10 to 20% cut in purchasing power. Uh, we also expect to see other. Uh, this really hit the impact on the uh, on the first time buyer market. Uh, and the other part of their uh, policy, which hasn't really been discussed uh, as much, has been portfolio insurance regulations. These are essentially regulations on lenders uh, that uh, that will make it more expensive to uh, to raise capital in markets, and that's going to put some. And that already has actually put uh, upward pressure on mortgage rates uh, from some of the lenders. Um, so when we're talking about these uh, these mortgage insurance rules, really it's it, it's been sort of uh, looked at as a way to address uh, topics of household debt, uh, high debt levels in Canada. Which, when we look at the household debt to disposable income ratio, they're quite high, about 170 uh, percent, and they're you know relatively in line with the U.S. would have had prior to the reset to their uh, big drop off. Uh, that being said, though, I think we should note that debt loads actually do remain relatively manageable, especially given the lowest trade environment that we're currently in, and we don't really expect to change much. Uh, but nonetheless, that was, was that, um, this type of environment is one of the triggers of why we saw this uh, change in mortgage insurance um, regulations. And the other one, of course, is that as much as it's a national, um, a, a national policy, it was largely geared at, Victoria, at the two large um, expensive markets of Toronto and Vancouver, which have seen 25% growth year over year in home prices in Vancouver, and about a 15% growth in Toronto home prices. Um, but the the impact, of course, is that even though this uh, our view is that this is really region specific uh, as a as what they were trying to uh, to hit, uh, it's a really a blanket policy. And a lot of the other markets that weren't um, uh, seeing such strong uh, strong economic growth as well as strong uh, housing price growth are going to see uh, declines in activity as well as prices as well as a result of the, the policy. Um, so I think that with our, our outlook right now for Canada being around, again, at 2% rate, um, inflationary prices aren't, are, are, still pretty, are still pretty benign. Um, uh, and also the, the current ex, uh, the outlook and uncertainty around uh, the U.S. election and the impact of NAFTA. Uh, we still don't have, we, we maintained our policy rate, or at least we think that the Bank of Canada will maintain our policy rate uh, at where it is and through 2018. There's going to be no change in the overnight rate. Uh, that being said, on the on the uh, the 10 year yields, we are, we're likely going to see some upside uh, potential, largely because um, those are going to follow more of the global bond yields. And if uh, as we've seen in the U.S. with the uplift in the 10-year Treasury or 10-year yields, um, you know that those inflationary expectations are, are boosting those uh, these broader long-term uh, long-term interest rates, uh, and that also means though that the Canadian uh, administered rates and um, potentially even mortgage rates would uh, would rise as a result, and so a lot of those are priced off of uh, the bond market. Uh, but for again for the policy side. Uh, we don't expect the Bank of Canada to move off of their their, their uh, half percent rate until 2019. 
there is, of course, there is a downside risk to the dollar, uh, with the Canadian dollar uh, really uh, reflecting what's happening at oil prices as well as as the, uh, the interest rates markets. Um, with the U.S. moving ahead of Canada uh, and by a, quite a big margin over the next couple of years, um, and also uh, there, there's still some uncertainty in the, in the oil prices, uh, we could easily see the uh, Canadian dollar falling to about a 71 cent range. We still have it trending or averaging about 73 cents uh, in 2017, 2018, but typically currencies do overshoot uh, and quite by, uh, and by quite a bit. Um, so again, that's going to be the risk that um, for the exchange rate. But again, a 73 cent dollar or so for 2017 uh, and 2018 based on the, the current environment. Um, so I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit for the for the second part of the, the presentation here, or the, the back half. Uh, when we're looking at the uh, the Canadian economy, we should remember that it's very much a we have a divergent patterns across Canada. It's not one single uh, economy that that's the same for all provinces. Uh, and what we've had is that BC has, has largely uh, outperformed the other um, other provinces in uh, in the most recent year, but also going forward. Uh, when we look at uh, last year, we had over 3% growth in uh, in BC, and what we're looking at now for 2016 and 2017 is that uh, we'll have that around 3 point, anywhere around 3.5% growth for BC this year, and about um, uh, probably around 2 point, we have about 2.5% growth for uh, the province in 2017 as well. Um, this is largely going to be uh, much stronger than other provinces, and it reflects what drives our economy uh, and what has driven our economy for the past year. Uh, the low Canadian dollar has really helped our tourism sectors. Uh, we have seen the interest rates helping the the, uh, the housing markets. Uh, we've seen the uh, TV and the film doing very well, um, and also other other uh, other exports as well have also picked up as a result of. Uh, of that low Canadian dollar. So not only service exports, but also manufactured products as well. Uh, and if we look at the current data, what we're seeing is that this is, uh, the data uh, largely aligns with our expectations. Uh, in the uh, employment numbers, we're showing uh, year-to-date numbers are trending over over 3% uh, employment growth in uh, BC this year. If we compare that to the Canadian numbers, what we're seeing is that it's head and shoulders above uh, every other province. Uh, Ontario is the closest at about 1%. Uh, with national growth around 0.8% in overall employment. So again, BC is, is really is really Canada's job engine at this point in time. Uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, are seeing negative uh, employment numbers. Same with PEI, Newfoundland, Labrador. So if we're just uh, if we look at our key themes here, again, I've already, I, I kind of mentioned these already, but these are the key themes we think are continue to, to uh, lift uh, the BC economy. Again, energy prices, exports, weaker Canadian uh, 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 have, have really helped our tourism as well as our service and goods exports. Uh, where the weakness is in BC is really going to be in the, um, I think, some of the domestic exports, so exports to other provinces because of the weak economic environment, but also uh, we still see low commodity prices, um, even with uh, an uplift in more recent months uh, or more recent weeks, uh, really impeding capital investments. Uh, housing boom in 2016, that is a, we, it's going to be, a, it has been a very large growth driver this year for the province, uh, but we expect to see uh, downside risks for uh, BC as a whole for housing in 2017. Um, if we look at Vancouver Metro, um, the fact is, is that Metro Vancouver actually is uh, is the key driver of everything that's happening in BC right now. If we were to extract out uh, British uh, Vancouver as well as, and to a lesser extent, Victoria, um, employment growth in BC would actually be negative for 2016. Uh, so we actually have more than 5.5% growth in uh, the Metro Vancouver uh, area. And and similar again, so whatever drives has been driving that uh, the BC number has really been the key uh, for um, for the uh, Vancouver as well. Uh, but there is more, however, there is more technology activity happening in the uh, the Vancouver CMA area. We're seeing a lot of growth in that area, uh, and seemingly uh, wage gains are coming from that as well. Uh, we've also seen a lot of the uh, international immigration pick up. Interprovincial migration has also climbed as well. When we have a weak um, uh, economy in Alberta, we've actually seen a lot of uh, inflows to the BC 
uh, the BC mark, but uh, and, and a large part to the Vancouver area as well in terms of interprovincial migration. Uh, so the employment growth is about 5%. We have unemployment rates of about 5% as well in Canada. If we compare that to uh, Can uh, Canada, uh, Vancouver's unemployment of 5% is uh, compared to about 7% rate nationally. Um, so the economy is actually one of the key drivers, I think, of our housing market. But we, when we look forward, uh, despite the fact that I think our demand drivers still remain very strong in Vancouver, uh, we see significant uh, downside risks for the Vancouver housing market at this point. We didn't uh, actually we didn't have this in our forecast a couple of months ago, but uh, things have changed on the policy side. Uh, so. There's been, it's been sort of been a year for Vancouver and BC as a whole as for a lot of macroprudential housing policies. Um, if we look at earlier this year, we had about a 3% property transfer tax on, on uh, luxury homes. Uh, we saw an instituted of a 15% foreign buyer tax Metro Vancouver in August. Uh, and then we more recently, we saw a tighter qualifying criteria, already mentioned that, for mortgage insurance for borrowers, and that was from uh, CMH or from the federal government that was uh, in October, and now we also have a vacancy tax announcement in the city of Vancouver as well. Uh, so, so right now it's pretty clear that uh, there's been a, a, a concerted effort of, by across governments to really try to clamp down on housing, and, and largely it has worked. Uh, I think that um, if we look at the data right now, uh, we've actually seen a substantial drop off in sales activity going back to the spring. Uh, people will mention, well, we dropped about 40 percent uh, since then. We must have been in a crash in terms of our sales activity. But the reality is that uh, the spring months were actually exceptionally strong. Part of that was a very low Canadian dollar, probably drove in some increased foreign buying. Um, but then after that, when we in implemented a detached um, sort of that uh, tax on luxury home, uh, then we also saw very high price growth in detached homes of 30 uh, percent. We saw a uh, a real um, a movement back to a sort of more normal activity in the housing market sales. Uh, but since then, we've continued to see the drop off. Um, since August, we've actually had a, another significant decline as a result of the foreign buyer tax. But it looks like the October numbers are showing uh, some moderation in the, in the sales activity, a little more flatness in overall activity. Uh, but we do expect to see, uh, we, we do believe that this is going to be temporary and, and further downside is likely. Um, and again, scanning the, uh, the housing market, what we're seeing is a lot of the declines in activity is in red here. That's the detached housing market. So most of the weakness that we've seen as a result of, of those factors has come from um, that component on the market. Uh, if we look at the condo and townhome sectors, uh, so uh, yeah, apartment, condo, and townhome sectors, uh, what we see is a, a much more moderate type of a decline. Uh, there's definitely some luxury product, of course, that's been hit, and foreign buying product that's been hit from the, the tax. But overall, it's been pretty steady. And that just really reflects the that uh, apartment and townhomes has been the uh, is now the de facto single family home for a lot of um, for a lot of individuals because that's what's affordable and they're being driven by what's happening in the economy which still remains quite strong in Vancouver in terms of overall job gains uh, as well as and the impact of that low interest rate environment. Um, that being said, though, the, the, the numbers in Vancouver are, are quite low. If we look at long-term trends, uh, adjusting them for population growth or population levels, what we see is that sales are, uh, are relative, probably the weakest since about 2012 um, uh, on a per capita basis. Part of that was an overshoot. Uh, we feel that in terms of the foreign buyer tax, a lot of that was a temporary impact. We had the way it was implemented, no grandfathering, uh, created a lot of uncertainty in the market, and that essentially drove um, sales probably lower than they should have gone, uh, and that would have worked itself out. Uh, going forward, we expect a lot of foreign buyers to come back into the market, um, largely just be, uh, because there's, there's different reasons for foreign buying. Some of it is uh, a long-term play on the region in terms of wanting to settle here in the future, having kids going to school and to university here. So those types of factors, if they're driving the market, those really won't um, those those bars will typically come back. Uh, speculation, however, those ones who are looking for a quick gain, uh, they're they've essentially been pushed out of the market in, in our view and into other areas like Toronto or uh, Seattle. Um, but even with all this drop off in activity, if we look at the sales active listings ratio, what we still see is that um, it's been a pretty balanced market. Uh, there's been significant differences depending on what area you're talking about here. If you're looking at detached housing. Prices. Uh, we're in a buyer's market in the detached housing sector right now. The 10% sales to active listings ratio. 
Uh, but if you look at the um, apartment and townhome, there are about 30 to 40 percent sales at active listings ratio. This is up until September. Um, so those numbers are still uh, pretty much in line with a, a relatively flat market. Um, that being said, though, we actually do expect to see price declines going forward. Um, and how much of a price decline? If you look at the average prices, which is in red here, um, you may be alarmed because it shows about a 20% drop off from peak, uh, but that's not a real price drop. That's a lot of it is um, compositional sales. Uh, the, the fact that there were a lot fewer detached home sales had an impact on average prices. Uh, when we look at the benchmark, which is in blue, it, it's uh, typically a lot flatter. Uh, it's showing uh, some modest declines, uh, turning over of, of price levels in the broader market. And if we look at it on a per product basis, uh, detached home prices are coming off and we've seen uh, pretty flat townhome and apartment numbers. And that kind of aligns with, again, that um, what I showed earlier about sales to active listings ratio showing a buyer's market in the detached segment and a uh, and still balanced seller's market in the in townhome and apartment segments in the market. Uh, that being said, like I said, we're going to see cuts. Uh, we are now building in uh, as a result of the the lower uh, the tighter mortgage insurance rules, which is going to hit the first time buyer um, and also low equity buyers. Uh, we are expecting to see sales decline about 10, 15, 10 to 20 percent from trend. Um, yeah, and on the pricing side, there's, uh, it's likely around the 5 to 10% range on the benchmark. Uh, but that does come after, a, uh, again, a, a large gain in, uh, in uh, year-over-year gains uh, up until the, essentially up until the summer uh, for, our, for all product types. Uh, we don't, however, expect to see this being a crash. So this, in our view, is a correction. Uh, and that really reflects the, um, the current inventory environment as well as the, this is a supply environment for uh, Vancouver. Uh, when we're looking at the listings or an inventory, there hasn't been any uh, real increase in new listings activity. Uh, active listings or so inventory in the market has only climbed because there's only fewer sales in the market. Uh, that being said, again, those sales to active listings ratio are still quite high. And there's also, in our view, not uh, there isn't much of a good reason for a lot of sellers to put their house on the market uh, in this type of environment. Um, some of them will. However, for the most part, uh, the, the economy and the job market remain strong. Nobody's really in a panic that they can't make their mortgage payments, uh, except for maybe some of those people who are looking for speculators or looking for quick gains. But for the broader market, what uh, this uh, show or tells us is that there's going to be uh, a period of very low sales, but very, very low listings as well. As people are just going to hold off on, uh, uh, on their decision making on the selling side of the, of the business. Uh, when we're looking at that was the resale market, but even if we look at the new home market, it's kind of a similar story is that uh, there's very low new home inventory as well. So we're not exactly expecting to see much of a, a massive overhang in, uh, uh, in new, home, new home inventory in the market, which would, again, precede uh, a substantial drop in, in pricing. Uh, so our view for the pricing side is that, yeah, we do have sales coming off uh, next year. Uh, but we're also expecting to see median prices. I, uh, we've been showing benchmark, but the median prices, which has all the different types of homes as well, uh, is going to be uh, pretty flat in our view on an annual basis, although there is downside risk from peak uh, in that 5 to 10% range in terms of median home values. Uh, where we do expect to see some uh, uh, contraction potentially in sales and the house, in activity at the housing start side, and this is what is going to um, uh, be a negative on broader provincial growth, but also uh, economic growth in the region, is that housing starts, which have been trending very high, and this is not only a Vancouver issue. Uh, Vancouver has been up about 40% year-to-date in housing starts, uh, which is really in line with, uh, with all the large urban markets in the BC. Uh, that being said, that as we do see the, the negative impacts of that macroprudential tightening uh, and uh, fewer pre-sales, um, now that should uh, lead to constraints in terms of housing starts into uh, 2016 and really into 20, uh, sorry, into 2017 and into 2018 as well. Uh, but again, if we look at the housing market as a whole, um, we're looking for what precedes a crash. And the fact is, is that I think the economy is doing well. There's very tight vacancy rates in the rental market. Uh, there's not a lot of inventory, and all of those factors are going to uh, uh, really keep that uh, that price uh, decline in check again at five to ten percent range. Um, are there further risks? Uh, I think that there there are in terms of the housing market in terms of a, a broader recession. Uh, if we see something really uh, negatively impactful in terms of the 
the U.S. politics and how it impacts the Canadian, uh, the Canadian economy, or um, if we start to see uh, inflationary expectations really run rampant in the U.S. Um, and, and impacting the mortgage rate cycle and, up, and uplift the mortgage rate cycles, those could have a more negative impact on uh, the Vancouver housing uh, cycle and, and the market. Uh, overall, in the past, we have seen large declines, but they usually are preceded by uh, an economic shock. Uh, and currently, it's still not built in our forecast. However, uh, there has been a lot of surprises this year in terms of the politics side. Um, so we'll be looking at that as a um, as a potential risk in the market. Uh, but for the housing market as a whole, I, I think it's safe to say in our end that this up cycle or this, uh, the current or the recent up cycle and uh, housing market demand cycle is really at an end. And this is really a policy driven end to uh, the, uh, the housing market cycle in Vancouver. And we will revisit it in our view of the, the long term housing price dynamics are still positive uh, over the longer term, largely because of a lack of the land availability issue and also a growing metropolis and growing area. Uh, but I think that for the next couple of years, we're going to be in a very much a, uh, a very uh, a flat or a, a, pretty, a relatively weak environment for both sales uh, and price growth going forward. Um, so um, that's my presentation. So I'll uh, open up to questions and if, or if Michael has any questions as well, I'd love to take them. Thanks, Brian. That is, uh, that is uh, great information and lots of uh, valuable insights there. Um, what we will do is at the end of this uh, presentation, there's an opportunity to uh, provide some feedback and also answer any, uh, ask any questions that you may have. So if you do have some questions, you can jot them down there and we will uh, respond to them uh, via your uh, via email to you or we can follow up if you want a phone call. But I think uh, some of the uh, information there really uh, highlights the need for us to make sure that you have a plan in your, um, whether it's saving to buy your first new home or it's saving for your retirement, it's really uh, important to have a plan and we'd love to uh, help you with that. So feel free to um, also let us know if you'd like one of our planners or financial experts to give you a call, um, and uh, we can help you with that as well. I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time to join us today. I want to thank Brian. That was uh, a really great presentation, and thank you, Brian, for taking the time to, uh, to uh, spend with us today. So everybody have a great day. Take care.